Next session up is uh, how well prepared is the Salt Lake Valley for pipeline incidents and what more could be done? And we're hearing from a, a, a number of people that think about uh, uh, how well prepared we are all the time. Uh, our first presenter today is Phil Oakes, and he's the National Program Manager Trainer for the National Association of State Fire Marshals. Uh, so uh, a number of years ago, the, the federal government, FIMSA, that you've been hearing from the last day and a half, you know, worked with the state fire marshals to develop a whole program about emergency training around pipeline emergencies. And, and Phil's been real involved with that, and he's going to start us off. And uh, he, like one of the other presenters, doesn't have a PowerPoint, so you won't have to try to follow along. I'm going to try to avoid the whole death by PowerPoint thing. And right. And Phil is one of the people that has to catch an airplane, so we're going to let him do his presentation, and then we'll open it up just for a minute or two if anybody has a specific question for Phil, and then he's going to jet out of here. I'm going to have to run real fast, too. Okay, Mr. Oaks. <laughs> you may want to turn that down. I'm probably going to blow out that microphone. So, <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, yeah. All right. If you've been to any of my presentations before, you know I'm a wanderer, so I'm going to actually stay at a podium and be really nervous this time because I don't want to drive that guy back nuts. So my name is Philip Oaks. I'm with the National Association of State Fire Marshals. I'm their trainer um, and their national program manager, one of the programs I do manage is Pipeline Emergencies. This is the second edition of that program. This was put together many years ago on behalf of a grant that we received from FEMSA in response to delivering real training to firefighters. A lot of the times we understand that operators by RP 1162 and a lot of other requirements have got to do the outreach. The problem you get is that emergency responders don't necessarily have to reciprocate or even know that that, re that is there. That requirement for you to outreach is there. So they're not as good as far as giving back the attention that you're asking for. But this program was written by emergency responders for emergency responders. It's easily customizable in four, eight, or 12-hour blocks. We're deploying it online. As a matter of fact, if you go to pipelineemergencies.com, where are those postcards at? They're out on the tables. Out on the tables, out front is a nice little postcard. It's got the website. It's also got my email address on it on the back, info at pipelineemergencies.com. That's a pretty easy one to remember for this conference, right? Info at pipelineemergencies.com. Now, you can smile every once in a while. It's allowed. <laughs> Nod your heads. At least let me know you're still awake because it's, it's kind of bright. I got the spotlight on me. I can't necessarily see all of you. Okay, so one of the things that we've discovered is with this training that's out there and available to emergency responders, a lot of the times what the operators are doing is what we call the dinner in the movie presentation. Okay, and we understand that it's a great way for operators to get out and outreach to a lot of folks at one time. Sometimes that is successful, sometimes it is not. The reason why it may not be is if, for example, you have a dinner in a movie presentation, first off, if you feed firefighters, they're going to show up. The question is how much they're going to learn. Okay, I've even learned that in my own small volunteer to fire department that I'm the chief of. I can feed them, but I better give them hands-on training because if I just sit them in a classroom after I feed them, they're going to fall asleep. Okay, those afternoon presenters, by the way, you might want to remember that too. Okay, now I got some chuckles. Okay, people are waking up. We're good. All right. The other thing that is, you know, is it really true training to give somebody an hour, show them a video presentation, ask them a question, make sure they check the box? Or have you proven that that training has exist? What's the difference between check marking the box as an operator and making sure that somebody's not going to die when they respond to one of your incidents? And I realize you call it an unintentional release. We call it a hazmat incident. All right, Carl? <laughs> to us, it's a hazmat incident. And we train on hazmat incidents since day one. Okay, and that's what we're going to call it. What we are really needing as responders is, yes, that RP 1162 requirement that says you've got to outreach to us, yes, we want that. We like that. We appreciate that. But come to us as a group, and please come to us and let us know that you're coming. And oh, by the way, the fire chief might not necessarily be the right guy to talk to all the time. Okay, in a large department such as Salt Lake, the fire chief is an administrative position. He's the one who has to deal with the political issues. He has to deal with the budget. He has to interact with a lot of other folks. The person who's going to be the boots on the ground that you want to train and you want to talk to, who you're going to meet when one of these things occur, is sitting right over there. Right? Or probably your engine company officer, if I'm guessing. <laughs> but you're going to see him eventually. So first off, yeah, meet with the fire chief. Tell him who you are. But try to get to that right person. Okay? And deliver that message. And again, if you want to get some more in-depth training, this program is available online, courtesy of FEMSA, free of charge. 
Okay, that's one of the things they told us. Deploy it online. It is. The book is online. The videos are online. The instructor's presentation is online. All free. Go view it as much as you want to. Okay, not a problem there at all. Also with that, as far as training responders, I want to make sure that I've got a, I've got a few points down. Carl, one of the things that you wanted to talk about was making sure that, again, that they all came to you, preferably at one time, with a common message. Okay, and you train on hazmat incidents as Recruit Academy? Recruit Academy and ongoing operational training. And your technicians undergo how many hours of training? 240 hours for hazmat technicians. And how much of that is pipeline? And how much would it be nice if the if your operators could call you and say, hey, can we get a couple hours during your tech courses? Be great, well received. There you go. Golden opportunity for those of you in the Salt Lake area when they're doing hazmat tech class. Those are the folks who are going to be on scene telling everybody pretty much how to operate. Okay? Excellent opportunity for you guys to do outreach. Any questions? I really like the interactivity here. Come on now. <laughs> I'm the guy who's got to catch an airplane, but I'm not in that big of a hurry. I'm just trying to catch you up in terms of time. But please, if you've got questions for me, I've thrown out an awful lot of ideas. Another thing that you can do, by the way, to help responders, and we mentioned this down at the CGA meeting last month, is you guys are required, the operators are required to give an emergency response guidebook to fire departments and emergency response personnel around your jurisdiction. Am I right? How thick is that manual? Anybody? Don't be afraid. Come on. I see somebody in the back talking about one. Come on. How thick is that manual? 20 pages. 20 pages. Okay. 20 pages. That's, that's better than average. Normally they're about 80 to 200. Okay. And I'm going to tell you as the guy sitting in the right, run, or right front seat of that fire engine rolling up on your call, I'm not going to have time to run through 200 or, or 80 or 20 or 40 pages. What I'm going to want is a two-page really quick guide that tells me this is what I'm worried about. Okay, or a PDF version of that that I can put. You guys got computers in the front of your rigs, Carl? Yes, we do. That I can put in that computer that I can call up. That's a quick response guide for me. That's a pre-plan. Firefighters, fire departments, agencies around the country know how to use pre-plans. We do it all the time. You can pre-plan an incident response to a pipeline in your area. And if one of the things you want as an operator is for us to call you, the very first thing that better be listed on that is a nice, big, in about 24 point font, maybe 46 for those of us that are getting a little older, point font, the number you want us to call. Okay, and even better than that, there better be a human being on the end of that line when I call. Because I don't want to call and I don't want to hit a machine. That's the last thing you want to see at two in the morning, right? I keep picking on him, but he understands, he's a fire guy. <laughs> So those quick response plans, if you can do that and laminate it and hand us to us, awesome. I understand you still got to give me that 200-page manual. And you know who's going to get that? That hazmat tech in about hour two or hour three of the incident when he gets on scene. Okay? He's going to be the one who's going to be looking through that. If he hasn't already, the chances are he has. That's the reference material. Me, I'm going to fall back on my basics immediately. And in Las Vegas, we called that SIN. Okay, you've all heard of Las Vegas and SIN. I apologize, but it's an acronym we remember in Hazmat Awareness. It's safety, isolate, and notify. It's the same three things that you people want. You want safety. You want us to isolate the scene and keep people away from it. We can do that. That's what we're trained to do from day one, and you want notification. That's our acronym. We know it. You know it. We need to talk the same language and get together here. Any other follow any other follow up questions or any follow up questions to begin with, Carl? Do you guys uh, still go to communities and do this training, or do you expect people to do it themselves online? One of the things that FEMSA did um, is because of certain budget cuts that they were under at the time, and I don't know if they're still under it, but we deployed it online so that people could get it online. If you want us to come to your department, we are still more than willing to do that. As a matter of fact, I've got three or four of those sessions set up here in the next few weeks, but there is a cost. We've got to cover our basic cost for me to go do that. Okay, so you've got to cover my airfare, meals, time, that sort of thing to go and do that. But yes, we do still do that. It used to be for free first edition. One of the things that we did is first edition was totally free. You got all the books, all the material, and we came and did it to you for free because that was the grant that we received from FEMSA. Now there was some federal budget cuts, so our budget got cut, and the best thing we could do was get it out in an online environment for free. Hopefully that changes in the future, but for now that's the situation that we're living in. 
and we have talked to Carl, and we are doing some outreach. Phil, can your office put the regulators and the operators in touch with the specific state fire marshal's office? Absolutely. We have agreed to do that in every state, and if they call us and they want us to, they want to talk to the local fire marshal or the state fire marshal, we're more than happy to get that done. As a matter of fact, we, do, we have a tremendous amount of outreach going on right now down in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. And if you remember the map from the first presentation today, there's an awful lot of pipelines in Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. So we're doing that on a regular basis. Yes? Scenario number six in this book deals with a crude oil rupture of a 24-inch crude oil line, okay, near a waterway, and that is some of the stuff that we discuss in here, is to consider the medical emergencies, consider the medical needs of the people nearby, and to begin isolating to a safe distance and getting those people evacuated and out. So that actually is, is in the curriculum already. And that was just created? This is the second edition. It's been out for about eight, to eight or nine months. First edition may not have gone into that that much of a, of a detail or not emphasized that point quite as much, but it's been out for about four or five years now. And again, that is part of the curriculum package now. It's listed as consideration, not only in that, but in a lot of other, um, there are nine scenarios in the back of this manual um, that part of it is you go through the learning process and then you gotta prove the learning, so that's why the scenarios are in there. There's some videos included in the online version with that as well, but evacuation is, is forefront. Yes? You know, just to reiterate the point, in reality, none of that happened. It was in the book, none of it happened. We were told to make our own decision. We were, it was left up to us to evacuate or not. We were given no information and no advice. We had nothing to work from. Some people left, some people didn't. People got sick as a result. There was nothing. That's the truth. It can be in, it can be in a million books. The truth is, nothing happened and it doesn't work. I mean, I'm listening to you, and it's just making me a little bit uncomfortable because, you know, it's on whatever page you're saying, but in reality, we were not told what to do. And we didn't have a copy of the book. We didn't know the book existed. We had no information. So a lot of us stayed in our homes because we didn't know better. Community outreach is key. I mean, absolutely key, and you've got to be talking to the folks. You've got to make those decisions ahead of time. But I, I wasn't here. I can't speak for exactly what happened. Um, I do know that in my jurisdiction, we've got a 42-inch natural gas pipeline running through that, and the first thing we're telling our folks is isolate, get those people away, get everybody away, back them up, you know, and we're talking miles, which in Wyoming it isn't hard because there's usually more cows than people around. That's a joke. By the way, you can chuckle a little bit. Okay, so it's not too hard to, to, to do those evacuations in my area, but I know it's, it's, it's a lot tougher on your end, so... And Carl can address that one a little bit better, I'm sure, when he comes up. Thanks, Bill. Thank you.